This is not going to be easy. Uh, thanks so much for being here as you all start to join us from all over, uh, wherever you're seeing it, from Facebook, from Twitter, from Locals. Uh, big thanks to all of our the members of our Larry O'Connor community over at Locals uh, for supporting everything that we do and allowing us to be able to do uh, events like this. This is wide open to everybody at YouTube and all of our subscribers at YouTube as well. Uh, I'm all tense right now. I'm all tense right now. This is not going to be easy. Um, we're going to be here for the next couple of hours, at least. I, leading you right up to the State of the Union address. How's that? We're, we're your pre-show for the State of the Union tonight as, uh, as President Biden celebrates his great achievements. Um, we're, I, I was joking earlier with Meredith that we're, we're basically throwing this thing together the same way Andrew would when he uh, would fill in for a radio show. If he filled in for Dennis Miller, I used to, Alex Marlowe and I used to sort of help him produce it and and um he would just throw everything at the wall he would like over the course of three hours he would book like 20 guests he said well hey, like andrew when when do you expect them to come on when do you want them how long do i don't know just have them all come on and we'll just talk they'll be fine don't worry about it and we're, we're sort of doing that honestly this is about you well we, listen we're going to tell a lot of stories we're going to tell a lot of our old stories and we're going to hopefully make you smile and make you cry a little bit too I know I, it's, I'm going to have trouble holding it together. I, I am immediately right back where I was 10 years ago. I remember doing a special show. It wasn't the night of his death, I don't think, but I think it was like the day after his death or maybe the day after that, March 2nd, March 3rd, on the old stage right show that we used to do and stream at Breitbart TV every night. And I'm, I'm like right back in that place where I'm, I'm barely holding it together. Uh, I can't believe it's been 10 years. But I, I do want this to be about you. Join us um, and, and sign in and make sure uh, that you that you comment and we'll we'll load it in there. In fact, we'll start with Mr. Fastbucks here, who uh, who says it all. War, yeah, that's amazing how war just took off and took flight and and sort of took over, didn't that? All right, here he is. Well, like I said, this is going to be exactly like Andrew would have. Uh, this is exactly how Andrew would have done the Dennis Miller show. When he was what back in the day, Alex, remember when Andrew would sit in for Dennis Miller and he would give us a list of like 20 guests to fit into three hours? Absolutely. We'd have like a guest for literally slotted for three minutes. Yes. It was right. short, shorter than a, than a Fox News primetime hit. And it was like, Andrew, we got to plan this out. And we got to say, oh, it doesn't matter. They're all my friends. We'll just have them all on at the same time. And everyone, I remember there were like six of us in studio all with a hot mic. It was nonsense. And I know why he did it. He did it because for all of Andrew's confidence, he was not super confident in his talk radio hosting ability. And in retrospect, Andrew was an okay host. He was maybe the best guest in the history of talk radio. But I don't yes. know if hosting was his thing necessarily. And the thing is for me, and I'm sure, Larry, you felt the same thing because you helped them uh, prep so many of those shows. It, it had the reverse effect of what he wanted. He wanted it to reduce the stress. It greatly increased the stress level, trying to cram yes. in all these people. They're like A-list people. It's like the real Dennis Miller? Like, it's the, it's the, right. we're doing his show. I mean, we got to have some sense of organization here. Right. Oh, I know. It was a nightmare. And it was also a blast. That's the thing. I mean, everything about working with Andrew every day, I think, and you can attest to this better than anyone, was incredibly fun, incredibly memorable. You were laughing the whole time. And it was also like the house was on fire at all times. Exactly. That, that, that is how he preferred it for whatever reason. And it's very, maybe you can relate to it more than I can, but I'm much more introverted. And to watch Andrew, Andrew relaxed when it was most chaotic. I just don't even understand this as a personality trait, but yeah. he really seemed to be most comfortable and most at ease when he was probably more comfortable screaming, stop raping the people at Occupy protesters than he would be like having a quiet night at home. That was probably more yeah. awkward for him than than uh, mixing it up with you know code pink and roller skates. So Alex, ev every year when we have to sort of struggle through remembering this horrific day that we all woke up to on March first back in 2012, uh, every year since then I've thought you know at some point I want to do this with Alex. I want exactly what we're doing right now, and I specifically want to bring up stories that we sort of 
promised ourselves we wouldn't talk about for a while <laughs> until until there was some distance. And if you don't if you don't want to delve into any of them, don't because a lot of these are just all happened like in the privacy of our office. But there's one in particular I'll never forget. You and I laughing about it and saying someday we're gonna we're gonna share this story. Do you remember the day? It was like within the last few months of Andrew's life. We were at the new offices on Sepulveda or right off Sepulveda. Remember when he met a homeless guy? on the street and and pulled out his phone and interviewed him on the street. And he came running back into the office. Like it was the hottest, most bra- like it was going to be a drudge banner headline. <laughs> this was the outtakes of citizen journalism yeah. that people don't see. And I can guarantee you, if you go to the project Veritas office, there are uh, just, just miles and miles and miles of, of footage of tape. <laughs> of of this stuff and andrew did for everyone where it was him you know showing up at that glenn Beck protest where he uh where he stumps the guy by simply saying name you know name one act of racism right and then he says, says i'm not going to play your games so right way, i'm not going to so, fall into that trap yeah <laughs> right, i might fall into that trap for for every one example of that there were several of andrew just like i went to lunch and zanku chicken and there was a guy outside and i talked to him i'm pretty sure this is content in fact i think i'm gonna dredge link off this yeah, you and I are going. I, I, I mean, Andrew, we don't want to doubt you or anything. We certainly don't want to distinguish your flame here, but uh, I got reason to believe that won't happen, and we're going to waste a lot of time in the process. You, you, we would be three deaths away from each other, and you would start IMing me the headline, like <laughs> breaking ma- ma- internet media mogul talks to homeless man on Sepulveda. <laughs> That is, it's probably, I would love to see those headlines. I wish we saved them because I'm sure that uh, it's, it's the Andrew is, you know, you had to believe in his vision, but it doesn't mean he didn't need an editor from time to time. Yeah, yes. And occasionally he did prove all of us wrong where he would be on board for something and maybe I was skeptical or you were skeptical or someone was skeptical and he did prove us wrong from time to time, but occasionally he didn't prove us wrong. And occasionally yeah. it was just, well, now that Andrew talking to homeless guy video stuff, which right. no one remembers unless you worked on that video. Right? Like, no one else remembers video. that one. Uh, although I got to say, it, as much as it pains me, I don't know if you remember this, but you just re- referred to the stop raping the people video. Um, you remember we decided that night that we would not post that at Breitbart TV. Remember? Um, he was up, it was at CPAC and he went up to do Huckabee up in New York and he came back the next day and he wanted to know what kind of traffic we got on the Occupy video. And I had to tell him standing in the lobby of the Marriott, we didn't post it because uh, the for various reasons, it wasn't our video, but also, frankly, we didn't think it made him look that great, you know? And he, oh my, he's never, that's the worst he's ever yelled at me that night when we, because he was really angry that we didn't post that. And he was right. And he was right. Well, yeah, that was an example where, in retrospect, that thing uh, did did got to get a mind of its own, and yeah. it did become something that was iconic. Uh, there are other ones, you know, that I probably won't get into yet. Though I'll think about it. But there's there were some examples where the opposite happened, where you know he insisted we put something up, and then we did put it up, and it didn't go well, and then yeah, he was yeah. kind of mad that we put it up. And yeah. those were tough moments. <laughs> yeah. In fact, yeah. those were some of the toughest moments. To be there honest were. With you. There were some very tough moments. But uh, I mentioned at the panel we did um, at CPEC uh, last week that my memory, I mean, I've, I've never laughed as hard as I did in those three years when I worked with him. I feel, Do you agree that sometimes, I mean, everyone says happy warrior, happy warrior, but I feel like too much of Andrew's memory right now is wrapped up in the warrior part and we don't reflect enough on the happy part. You know, if you see the tributes to Andrew on the front page of Breitbart.com uh, that we've had up all day, which I, I, it almost is like a documentary. It's really incredible stuff. Yeah. I mean, the, the who's who, the conservative movement from, you know, Clarence Thomas on down uh, are in it. The happy part comes through more than the warrior part. And oh, that's good. something is it's near. It's a narrow margin, I would say. But I would say overall, people are spending more time today. And I know I have thinking about what an amazing person Andrew is and not just what a warrior he was, because uh, uh, actually of his two big legacies, jocularity and righteous indignation, we're probably a little heavy on the righteous indignation now and a little light on the jocularity. It's very tough to do because it's a darker time than it was 10 years ago. Uh, And it's it's sad that that's the case, but it is the case. But I do think a hundred percent, he would want us to have fun and to have a good time and to you know, uh, to to engage in that sort of behavior, yeah. um, it, more than we do. 
Um, I know. By the way, thank you for for giving us time because it's uh, uh, you know you're on the are you on the west coast? I, can't, I forget which coast you're on now. Are you back in? I'm, I'm, I'm on both coasts. I'm on both, on both coasts. coasts. It's, it's, right. it's the it's top secret. But I'll tell you. Can you see my set, Larry? This I is can. very, it's and very impressive. Look yeah. at this. It was a two year old's birthday over the weekend. Master um, Marlo Jr. I named him after his big brother, Master Marlo. Very impressive. Um, and you get the Dalmatians. We get the happy. Yeah. See, but I thought this was very Andrew. Like normally, you ask me even for a, a live stream because you know I I know how much culture and image matters typically i would i would get showered and i would i would do my hair and i'd set up my nice lights oh, uh, but in the spirit of andrew this one i just walked over i buttoned my shirt and i walked over and plopped Dude, the computer down this is so, this is it's the stage right show come on that you, 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 you this is this is what andrew would have wanted also Larry. that's right thinking, but he would do his cpac speech like this yes and 10 million people would see it. actually and especially the homage to the kids because i mean let's face it when you your first day on the job, I think you were moving a desk down a set of stairs into his basement, and the kids were everywhere, um, and they they were toddlers. No, it was amazing. It was one incident where one of the children uh, made a bowel movement within arm's length of my desk. I was hoping you would bring this up. Yeah. And another one where I don't want to I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm being ungrateful for the incredible life that Andrew gave me, but but there were moments like these that I that did come as as a tax, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, when I used to work by the bathroom and when the, the potty training takes place, sometimes you don't make it all the way to the bathroom. Yes. It's, you get very close, which uh, was, it was, the turd itself was somewhat shocking. But what was more shocking was when, uh, when, when uh, one of the parents came down and suggested that it was a good job to get that close. Yes. <laughs> that was what I was like, what, what? That's a good job. It looked like a well. miss. Well, you 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 understand that now as you're in the middle of it. You got to oh, be very. Oh, I close. very much understand it now. Now, now I can relate. Look, th this was, but it, it wasn't a big education for me. Uh, that's kind of funny because the uh, big education was was one of the yes. sites we thought about launching. Uh, yeah. But it wasn't education because it was so grateful for me as someone who did grow up and was kind of uh, told that I was a smart person and I had like, good qualities and. Um, it was really amazing for me to step out of this this sort of womb that is college and then go straight into Andrew Breitbart's world where yeah. it's intense and you're dealing with some of the smartest people who you know have ever typed uh, into a keyboard. And it was very humbling a lot of the time because I realized how little I knew about the world. And because of Andrew's peer group, who was so amazing, I was really able to sort of humble myself and to learn a lot for years and years and years before I was even remotely out there. Yeah. And that was such a great lesson. Something I'd recommend to just about every 22 year old. Can I ask you, and, and I'm going to let you go because I know you're, you're, you know, dealing with the site and it's a busy day and, and I don't want to occupy your time, but I've always wanted to ask you um, since I, cause I left um, within a year of Andrew's death and obviously that the site has just exploded. Thanks to me leaving. Uh, and it's just, it's just done so well. And, and you're, you're editor in chief and you're running things and you've been running things for many years. When you bring in new employees, when you bring in people who, you know, may have known about Andrew or maybe were inspired by Andrew or saw Andrew when they were teenagers, but never met him. Do, do new employees sort of get any kind of not formal briefing or formal education, but do, do you instill with employees at Breitbart sort of the Andrew ethic and who Andrew was and what he was about? It's, it's the question, and it's something that I would hope is done in every newsroom, even ones that don't have Andrew's name on it, because he had the toolkit. He knew how to handle just about every situation. He knew the importance of narrative, but he also knew the importance of telling the truth. He didn't like getting stuff wrong. He really didn't. He was uh, – I, I never saw him shine on a mistake. So he had this amazing ability to – use those tactics of jocularity and righteous indignation. Think about these rolling narratives in terms of stories, uh, trying to have fun with the website every day, trying to be fast paced, trying to set the tone, even when the rest of the world is telling you X is the story, if you really believe Y is the story, you can genuinely pull it off and convince the world that Y is the story, as you guys yeah. said a number of times. I mean, Larry, you get direct credit for the N-word um, a Capitol Hill hoax, which I mean, you guys just totally hit that one out of the park. And that was when I was in the office with you. And I knew it was good. I didn't know that you guys were going to be able to make it the biggest thing on the planet, which you did. And hopefully maybe you can share some of that because that was a, a huge feather in your cap. But yeah, you right. guys worked that thing to the bone. 
and you make you force that issue. Yeah. And these are exactly the stuff I'm telling younger journalists. Um, but it is it is hard to follow in Andrew's footsteps because he was one in a billion, maybe more, and will never replace him. I've never even made any claim to try and replace Andrew. It never would. No. Uh, it has to be a collective. It has to be all of us. And by the way, Larry, I would love to hire you back. We got to figure out a way to do that. We got to figure is out a way to get that done. Oh, really? Oh, the, it, you, you're trying to sabotage the site, are you? You, I, I don't know. I, I get a feeling that you're priced out at this point. But if you're not, then, then let's find a place for you. Let's find a place. Well, we'll talk. Maybe this isn't the forum. Maybe, maybe, maybe this is not the approach. Exactly the forum. This is how I, this is how I always open my negotiations. In the you're you're so going to prey on my emotions. You're going to take advantage of me, Marlo. You've done it before. Uh, all right, Liz. Is there one thing? I know it's impossible to nail it down to one thing, but but I mean, when you look back on all of those, especially the early years before things got crazy. I always liked to, uh, to me, the line of demarcation is the basement team and the post basement team. It, sure. it did um, not that, I mean, we were still sort of renegades and we were still scrambling, but in the bit, like, I remember that day that you were given a present by your desk. If I remember right, I, I came down and I said, what did I miss? And you, I'm not going to name the child because yeah, they're a young no, adult no, now. No, no. Yeah. But, but you said, so-and-so just dropped a deuce on my desk. <laughs> If I remember right, is how you put it. And I'm like, wow, okay, it's a fun day. I'm glad I missed it. Uh, yeah. What what it sticks out to you? The child's probably like 30 now. Yeah, right. Probably like <laughs> like 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 a, a Ivy League law student. But sort of, I mean, with all of the stories from from the Wiener to the uh, Acorn to people forget the big stories. Uh, the NEA story out of Big Hollywood was huge. First person to have to resign from the Obama administration. Um, all of those different, I mean, what what sort of, if you had to land on one thing, if, if yeah. you could land on one thing? It, it, it's really hard. I'm going to try to, the answer is Wienergate, but but I, but I that's a little boring, so I'll try to add a little bit more to it. Um, because it's something that's been interesting during the last month or two, as I've been thinking about Andrew every day, uh, in the lead up to this day, uh, which I'm really hard to see that you're, you're participating, Larry, in an extra way. Like, this is exactly what I was hoping, is that people would try to do their own uh, homage to Andrew, their own personal celebration, because that's what he would have wanted. Um, and I was thinking about things like how when when Andrew and James O'Keefe got Acorn defunded, they did it with Democrats having the majority in both houses of Congress and the presidency. Yeah. And I hadn't thought of how significant that is. Like that is in 2022. That has totally different meaning than it did in 2009. I mean, it, it just seems like such a gargantuan task. Uh, not only that the New York Times and the Washington Post didn't write one uh, a single column on the story until Acorn was already defunded, which in yeah. and of itself is an amazing accomplishment. It was they got through all three branches. I were uh, I mean judicial sort of, uh, but you know the both houses of Congress and and the presidency. Um, the, all those are controlled by Democrats, and Acorn still got defunded. That was unbelievable. But of course, Wiener was my favorite um, for a couple of reasons. The the first one is that was the first big story where I take some level of credit, which is of course not nearly as much as Andrew gets, but uh, I was a voice in the room that was yeah. suggesting that we needed to go with the story, even though we never had done a sex scandal before. And the reason why was because he claimed he was hacked. Yes. And you, yeah. Just can jump I in. jump? Can I jump in? Because yeah. I was part of that phone call that night. That was an incredible night, and it's embedded into my head. And everyone, there was a big debate about whether we could run with this story or not. And Alex, you were the one. You said, "Let me just say something." He's just deleted his account, and he has claimed that he was hacked. That's the story. The story is that a sitting congressman is claiming that he was hacked. Now we can reveal what was there, but you you were able to laser beam down on it. You're so right, and that got the ball rolling. And I was very proud of that because a lot of that I think comes back to how I found Andrew, which was because I was a Drudge super fan, and I learned that Andrew was an editor of the Drudge Report. And this is how Drudge did the Lewinsky scoop. Like he didn't do it. He didn't act like this is a sex scandal. He wrote it up as this is a media scandal, that this is a scandal. So he took kind of a circuitous route to it, that it was the Newsweek killed this amazing story by Michael Isikoff that was a career making story. And they had just cut it up because they were protecting Clinton. And that was kind of the narrative. And that was so genius. And I think that was kind of in the back of my mind when we were looking at this thinking, maybe this isn't, you don't do it this way. Maybe you do it as the hacking angle. And that Andrew was convinced by that, I do think speaks volumes about him because I was probably, you know, 24 at the time. And this was the first time I've ever kind of weighed in like that and in a big company decision. And I could tell he was thinking about it and gave me 
Uh, he kind of he kind of gave me credit, and then he took the ball and he took it to the house with the 360 windmill slam dunk yeah. on that story from there. But you know that was such a such a shot in the arm for me, and I cannot imagine we'd be having this conversation if it wasn't for that conversation that night, which is just, it gives me chills just thinking about it. Yeah. And then yeah. of course the cherry on top with him hijacking the Wiener press conference, perhaps the single best video on all of YouTube of the <laughs> millions and millions of videos that might be my favorite. By the way, and, and, and it's true, but everyone needs to know this because everyone thinks of that day and it was such a triumphant, cathartic, incredible, hilarious, and, and uh, 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 vindicated day for all of us. But people have to know the week leading up to that, from the moment we ran that story, which I think was a Sunday night going into Memorial Day, or uh, maybe a Friday night going into Memorial Day weekend, all the way through that press conference. It was, I think, eight days. That was the week of hell. We thought we were all going to be indicted. We, I mean, that was that was terrifying that week. They put us through hell. He put us through hell. Wiener did. Yeah, because he kept lying and smearing Andrew. And that's why, but good for him for apologizing. Who apologizes these days? I yeah. mean, it's just no one, does, and if they do, they're only just trying to get the cancel mom off their back. Yeah. Um, but it, that's the only thing nice I can say about Wiener. And to think all of that led up to the Comey hearing at the very end before the 2016 yes. election. Yes. It's another one that Andrew gets credit for again, which I mean, if you want to give details on that, by all means. Well, um, but yeah, I think it was a Friday night, if not, it's not Friday or Saturday. It was definitely a weekend night. And that yeah. was a just an amazing moment. And uh, boy, those memories are so good. Yeah. What what Alex is referring to is the, the Comey deciding that there were more Hillary emails on Anthony Weiner's laptop. 10 days before election day in 2016, that was a direct result of the ongoing FBI investigation into Anthony Weiner's behavior that started with the Breitbart expose on him. Uh, phenomenal times. All right. Well, I mean, we could go on and on. We should go on and on, but, but, but we will, we'll, we will at another time. Someday we're going to write a book, maybe a screenplay. I got to tell you the miniseries now, the, the screenplay. I, I watched some of the SAG awards, Larry. Did you watch some? It's kind of, it's a sad state of affairs. To it is. Right now. It is. Did you see by any chance Netflix did a, um, I think it was a, uh, a series. It may have just been a movie, but about the origins of national lampoon and, and the creation of national lampoon and all those guys. I haven't who, seen it again. You got to, you got to watch it. Cause you'll think of, all, you'll think of Breitbart. You'll think of the early wow. days of, of the site and, and what it took to get the site up and what we did. I mean, it was the show that should be done is was uh, the and this was being discussed was a show that's like TMZ, but Andrew Breitbart's the Harvey Levin. Yeah. So yeah. we have still to this day very entertaining um, conference calls multiple times a day with our editors, who are incredibly knowledgeable people. And you know, we're lean and mean. We're, we play money ball, so we're not a huge staff. We're kind of a medium right. sized staff. And, but I mean, picture Andrew running something like that. Look at the personalities who came through Breitbart from uh, Ben Shapiro to Peter Schweitzer to Steve Bannon to Dana Lash to you to me, uh, James O'Keefe. I mean, the list goes on and on. You these, these people cycling in yeah. to be in Andrew's newsroom and talk through the stories. Like that would be, I did, I, I regret that that never happened about as much as I regret anything. Well, that newsroom we had um, when he passed away uh, in 2012 was set up perfectly for it. It had that that center bullpen at the bottom and and everything and yeah I remember Shapiro if I remember right the day before he died Shapiro and I were down down at the bottom sitting on those like beanbag kind of chairs writing uh, working on stories and we were arguing and debating about which was better Sound of Music or King and I yeah and Andrew Andrew did not like that he yelled at no, us but it was, it, it's a great debate it's a great debate and I'm a sound <laughs> I, I I vote Sound of Music do I vote wrong or am I or am I in the right camp? Oh no, you're with me. I agree with you. He likes King and I better. He does, Shapiro doesn't know anything about pop culture. Okay, he's a brilliant guy, but I, I don't, don't ask him about. It. He and I have the same taste in that regard. No, he has taste like an eighty year old. He's it's awful. It's embarrassing. It's very funny. Very funny. And, uh, Alex yeah. Marlowe, the man who keeps it going uh, over at Breitbart. It's so good to see you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you guys for the incredible tribute that you put together on the sites today. By the way. Thank you, and thank you, Larry, for continuing to be such a great uh, ambassador for Andrew's legacy. Which well, you that, deserve a, a lot of credit for that. That's easy. That's easy to do. Take care, my friend. All right. Thanks. Thanks again. Bye, everyone. See you.